Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Ward. I'm the Policy and Communications Director at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and Environment at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And I'll be your chair for this very special event hosted by the RSA. I'm delighted to be joined today by Gaia Vince. Gaia is a science writer and broadcaster. She's held senior editorial posts at Nature, the uh, science journal, and New Scientist. And her writing has featured in The Guardian, The Times, and many more newspapers and magazines. In 2015, she became the first woman to win the Royal Society Science Book of the Year prize, uh, solo for her debut, Adventures in the Anthropocene, which I have a copy of here. Um, <clears throat> It was um, subtitled, A Journey to the Heart of the Planet We Made. Her new book, Nomad Century, which I also have a copy of here, uh, is out now and will be the subject of our conversation today. And Guy, I want to say right from the outset that uh, how much I enjoyed reading your book, um, even more than your last book. So anyway, welcome, Guy. Thanks, Bob. Um, thanks so much. It's, it's a pleasure joining you on this. And uh, as I said, I really enjoyed it. it. It's actually tackled a very difficult subject, which actually I don't think gets enough discussion, uh, partly because I think um, scientists and economists and other researchers find it difficult to really estimate um, future patterns of human migration, which is a key issue you, you take on, and partly because it's such a politically difficult issue at the moment and and so i think it took a great deal of courage for you to to take it on and and what i was very impressed with is how reasonable you've been all the way through although that's not to say that you don't have strong views on this and i hope you'll you won't hold back uh, as we discuss uh, over the next 40 minutes or so go through some of the key issues so if you're happy to um, perhaps i can um, ask you a few questions about uh, about it so can we start by uh, thinking about the sh sheer scale of the challenge we're going to be facing uh, in the next decades and indeed centuries um, as the climate does change in response to rising levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Could you just sort of outline what kind of assumptions you made about future climate change um, in order to kind of set the scene for the book? Yeah, well, um... It, it, is, it is a phenomenal change that we're all going to be experiencing, a huge upheaval. And, and yes, Bob, I don't think that people really appreciate just how big a change this is because, you know, we, we've heard the narrative of keeping below um, or keeping 1.5 alive and, and this idea that um, if we do, then somehow we will stave off climate change and it won't really happen or it won't be that bad. And you know, yes, of course, if we if we manage to raise the temperature only by um, a smaller amount, uh, the effects of the climate impacts won't be as great. But we are still looking at extreme conditions, more extreme than humans have experienced in the whole of our evolutionary history. I mean, the Earth has swung in and out of extreme change um, throughout its four and a half billion year history. But we've been here a relatively short period of time. You know, most of our history of our evolutionary history has actually been in um, the Pleistocene in, a, in an ice age. Um, and we are we are still in a sort of ice age, the Holocene, we're sort of leaving um, leaving that um, severe um, ice age. But we still have ice at both poles. That's the, that's the characteristic of of our geological age. And since the whole of um, agriculture was invented and civilizations uh, were established, cities and the lifestyles that we are now accustomed to um, in recent years, all of that has taken place in a very different climate in the Holocene, a time of uh, relatively stable climate, predictable, relatively predictable monsoon patterns, um, a, a time of low human population, plentiful resources, well, you know, we have left that now. We're now in a new era, the, the Anthropocene, an era dominated by our human activities. And 
Well, we're starting to see that it's no longer a case of um, of mitigating our emissions, of, of reducing our emissions to stave off climate change. Climate change is underway. We've already changed the climate. And it's not just in the global south, although more severely felt there. We're experiencing it everywhere on Earth. You know, we've just had an incredibly severe um, summer of extremes, you know, from, from starting in the spring with India and Pakistan enduring months, months of heat waves and then um, catastrophic floods um, across Asia, then um, heat waves, a heat dome that just sort of sat on the Northern Hemisphere for a long period and um, led to wildfires, even in Britain. You know, I couldn't send my kids to school in, in London um, because, of, because of the heat wave, because we're not adapted to it. We're going to experience more and more extreme conditions and, um, and these are going to become more frequent and occur for longer and affect more and more people. And, you know, it's, it's not just that we need to reduce our emissions and get to net zero, which of course we have to do. We also have to cut below net zero because we have to withdraw the carbon that we've already emitted and the carbon that um, natural systems are now unnaturally emitting because of the conditions that we're imposing fact that um, forests are experiencing droughts and wildfires so instead of um, being a net absorber of carbon dioxide as they were um, they're now emitting carbon dioxide from soils um, and, and from uh, dead vegetation so, so we need to cut down our emissions we also need to adapt but what nobody is talking about is the fact that in some places they simply won't be able to adapt we, we are pushing the climate conditions this century um, expecting temperatures well at some points they will certainly even if we bring it down to 1.5 at the end of the century um, they temperatures will exceed 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial average um, from at least from the 2030s these temperatures are going to go up and up and up and Every time the uh, the temperature goes up, more energy is being is is being inserted into the uh, into the atmospheric Earth systems. Meaning we get more extreme weather conditions. Meaning we get hotter um, heat waves. We get uh, more persistent droughts. We get uh, more melting ice. We get higher storm surges. We get the erosion of coastlines, and most of these. Um, it, most extreme impacts are going to be hitting the uh, centre, the tropical um, regions of our globe, making areas that contain um, the, the most populated places on the planet unlivable, at least for um, days, if not months of the year. Yeah, so <laughs> you've spelt out very clearly uh, the risks we face. I know that... Um, some people have questioned because you mentioned in the book, you know, the possibility of us seeing warming of four degrees by the end of the century. But I, my response to that is that nobody sensible at the moment will rule that out as a possibility because we just don't understand the system uh, yeah, so well enough. I have had um, people saying that that's, you know, that's impossible, and I'm being a doom mongerer, and, and we won't get that high and. It is true that we are no longer following the business as usual worst case scenario of the um, of the IPCC um, uh, forecast. We're not doing that anymore. Thank goodness. You know, we are all reacting. But, you know, I, I looked at these temperatures very carefully with um, with Met Office modelers who who really are looking at um, the the these, you know, we don't know exactly what temperature we're going to hit. It depends, the future is still unwritten. It depends completely on um, the pathways we choose, whether or not we um, exceed tipping points. And um, at least four tipping points are, um, are uh, very seriously vulnerable after we raise global temperatures above one and a half degrees above pre-industrial averages. So, so, you know, if we start getting runaway climate, um, climate change impacts, then we could easily exceed four degrees. But, but I, I looked at the temperature of between three and four degrees um, Celsius, because there is a reasonable likelihood of us, of us hitting that temperature. 
um, somewhere between that, um, because of various feedbacks that we get. I mean, I spoke earlier about um, forests at the moment, you know, we, 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 we're on this big tree planting splurge at the moment. And, and part of the reason for that, apart from its benefits to uh, the natural world, is because um, photosynthesis, trees and uh, forests and um, marine uh, photosynthesis all um, draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But as we trigger these um, changed conditions, as our forests, instead of becoming uh, net absorbers and net drawers uh, sucks, they're called carbon sucks, um, as, as that happens, as they, as they tip over into net emitters, which is already happening for parts of, say, the Amazon um, and other big vulnerable forests, we can very easily see a system flipping where we emit a lot more carbon. Um, and soils are one, one factor that is very vulnerable at the moment, and we just don't have enough um, modeling data to rule out, certainly to rule out three to four degrees. And so, um, you know, I, I really think it's I really think it's important that that policymakers and, and scientists as well are really honest about this, that there that there is actually um, quite a serious risk that we do hit these catastrophic temperatures. And, you know, when you buy a house, you don't expect it to burn down or for the um, for it to be completely flooded and you probably won't experience that but nevertheless you do take out house insurance right it would be um it would be incredibly remiss and foolhardy not to because these things can occur well what we're doing is we're pushing our entire civilization into this risky zone where this could happen it could be completely catastrophic and we're not seriously, we're not even, um, policymakers are not even seriously facing up to what 1.5 degrees means. You know, it means huge change about where we plant um, our crops, what sort of agriculture is possible, what sort of um, continual, um, <clears throat> excuse me, what sort of continual extreme conditions we face, even in the relatively wealthy world. I mean, just looking um, today, for example, um, at uh, what's going on with Hurricane Ian. You know, it's wiping out parts of Florida, South Carolina. Um, it's, it's hit um, Puerto Rico. Uh, they've been in um, a power outage. Large, large proportion of the, um, of the island's been in um, power outage for more than a week. I mean, you know, these are very expensive uh, mistakes or, you know, events apart from apart from anything else and and we need to be honest with people about exactly what we're facing because if we're not you know there we can't take society on board with this enormous transition transformation to a decarbonized society which which we need to make very quickly yeah i i mean i i, I think it's pretty clear that um it would be dangerous for anybody to rule out uh, a warming of four degrees uh, as you say, there are lots of uncertainties in our understanding of feedbacks which could push us over that. And, and indeed, of course, lots of lots of planning, you know, the the uh, plans by the UK uh, Climate Change Committee include an assumption, well, what would happen if if the UK warms by four degrees? So it's a, it's a kind of um, something that lots of policy makers do and and you were quite right to say in this book but i mean I, the one thing i would say is i think a lot of the impacts can happen at much lower temperatures that's what we're going into uncharted territory um it's going to be lots of nasty shocks and indeed i think we've seen in the, this summer in the uk you know breaking our own temperature record by 1.6 degrees was shocking canada last summer it's uh, temperature record was broken by f uh, four degrees. I mean, it's kind of unprecedented. It's the real, I think, uh, worry that a lot of these impacts are starting to happen more quickly now. But um, perhaps we can move yeah, on now. Also, sorry, go also, ahead. Sorry, I just, I just say that these are average temperatures. Of course, yeah. parts of the world are already exceeding, you know, they're already warming yeah. faster than this already. Quite, quite um, right. Quite and, right. It's a global average, and there are some that are warming uh, 
even faster. But can we move on then to kind of maybe you could outline how you expect human migration to respond then to these kind of changes that we're beginning to see and will will happen in the future. Yeah, so so as these um, extreme conditions um, occur more and more frequently and more severely, there will be places that simply cannot adapt. I mean, we're talking now from um, a relatively rich country, which will be uh, which will be far less impacted actually by um, extreme conditions, and um, has a lot more capacity, a stronger institutions, a lot more capacity to adapt. It will have to adapt. The reason that um, we suffered so severely um, with temperatures in the 40s uh, was because we we're not used to that our infrastructure is not set up for those sorts of um conditions it will have to be it will have to be changed um so that railways so that airports so that schools and hospitals can function they have things like air conditioning if you look in the poor world um, we, um along the uh, equator these are places which are going to be much more severely impacted and which they cannot adapt to the degree at all. So, I mean, take Mumbai, it's a population of um, something like 22 million, 9 million people live in slums, slum housing there, which is like little concrete boxes with corrugated metal roofs separated by narrow airless alleyways. They are frequently inundated because uh, Mumbai is on the coast and it's experiencing uh, regular floodings now. Um, how are they going to adapt to temperatures? They're already six to 10 degrees hotter in the slums than in the, uh, in the rest of Mumbai in the city. Air conditioning units are in um, you know, the swanky hotels, um, in, in the shopping malls and so on. They're not in the slums. And there is no way that these 9 million people can have air conditioning in their slums, uh, this is these little boxes. It's just not going to work. Um, you know, they regularly have power outages when they have heat waves because they can't run the air conditioning, the small amount of air conditioning that city already has. This is also the case for large parts of Bangladesh, also the case for places across Africa, across the Americas. There are places that will not be able to adapt to these extreme temperatures people will have to move. It's, they're unlivable places. Now, at the moment, what we have is the system of, um, of uh, restrictions stopping people uh, using this, this adaptation. Um, and migration is an adaptation, uh, which multiple animals and plants use to, uh, to move away from, from um, environmental conditions that are hazardous and which humans use, but we have put, we have imposed these um, border restrictions which stop people doing it. I mean, people are already migrating. Climate migration very much is a, um, a reality at the moment and it's increasing. What we need to do is have a, an absolute paradigm shift in how we see the human geography of our planet. Because we are entering these uncharted territories, we are entering these extreme conditions, unprecedented in our, in our history. We need to have a look at where the safe lands are for people, where we can grow our crops, um, where we can produce energy. We need to look at the globe in a completely different way and we need to make this happen. We need to manage migration so that it is not a catastrophe so it is not a constant conflict ridden world that we're entering but a safe productive transition into a a sustainable future yeah um i mean it's quite clear i mean and in your book you talk about historically how uh humans have tended to migrate to uh, off, sometimes to escape adversity, but also to to uh, create better conditions. So it's a kind of a very natural response. So why is it that you think? Why do you think at the moment in many countries, including in Britain, migration is 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 portrayed as a, a real problem, not a solution? And uh, why do you think that is? And is there anything we can do to change change that opinion? 
Yeah, well, we have allowed the narrative around migration to become really toxic. This is a completely natural phenomenon. Um, all of our cities, um, they are founded through migration. They are completely reliant on migration. Um, I don't think I know anybody who lives in the same house that they were born in. Um, very few live in the same city they were born in. Most of us have migrated. Um, it's a completely normal phenomenon. It doesn't make you an immoral person. It's not, um, <laughs> it's not ethically bad to migrate. In fact, most people are moving uh, for work. They're looking for work. Um, and they move to where the jobs are. And by definition, if the jobs are there, that's because there is a need for workers. There is a need. And migration really is, it's not a security issue. It is an economic issue. But what's happened is we are living in this, um, in this unfortunate time of uh, populist governments, of nationalist leaders. And um, it is the most cynical ploy ever to, to basically use, use migrants as a scapegoat for everything, for um, job problems, for failing um, social security, health, welfare systems. And it's very easy to do because migrants are very vulnerable um, to all of these. But actually, if you look at the evidence, there is so much now, there, is, there are so many studies showing repeatedly that migrants arrive and actually um, increase the wealth, they increase the productivity of cities where they, uh, where they, uh, um, where they integrate well, where they um, are allowed to work. Uh, what we do is create barriers which prevent that process from working. So um, if, we are, if we don't have inclusive policies, if we don't have, um, if we don't allow migrants to legally work, and, legal, and pay taxes, if we don't make them, um, enable them to be socially included, then we do end up with divisions. You know, um, migrants will, uh, will create their own black market economy, which will compete with the formal economy if they're not allowed to join the formal economy, if they're not allowed to work. Um, you know, and then they are completely reliant on benefits, again, creating, creating conflict. The answer to this is to invest properly in migration management schemes so that people really are included. I mean, the, the evidence shows through countless studies that migrants don't um, increase crime rates. In fact, in most places, they actually decrease them because um, they have a lot more to lose if they, if they commit crimes and are caught. Um, they don't um, increase unemployment or drive down wages. In fact, the opposite is true. And that's because the economy is not a zero sum game. There isn't um, a set number of jobs available. And um, if migrants come, they take some of those so that the existing native population gets a smaller share. That is not how it works. I mean, it sounds fairly logical and fairly plausible, for, fairly plausible but it's, it's not how it works. In fact, migrants increase the demand. So um, they, they, you know, for goods and services, they want to buy things and they need to have their hair cut and go to the dentist. Um, so they increase that uh, demand. So there is so that um, increases productivity. They add to um, the workforce either generating businesses or more often what happens is the um, general productivity increases, the economy increases. So there are more businesses set up and those businesses are generally um, set up by native people who have better connections, better language skills, more secure finances. Uh, so they get a boost generally in their um, living standards while also employing uh, immigrants. You know, immigrants do jobs that free people from um, unpaid labor, whether it's childcare or domestic duties, for example. And that allows in our patriarchal society, mainly women to rejoin the workforce. So they boost the economy because they're part of a greater economic system and, and systems work with emergent properties. They're greater than the sum of their parts. So the bigger the population, the more um, benefits you see. 
um, from that, but it has to be handled well. And we've seen countless examples of where it's not handled well, whether it's, um, you know, Britain with this ridiculous policy of trying to turn people back and incarcerating uh, people, and um, that doesn't help anybody and just creates uh, division and is inhumane. But also take somewhere like Sweden, who, you know, on the surface did this great job of uh, bringing in lots and lots of um, refugees, but didn't do the hard work of social inclusion. You know, you have to invest at the beginning in things like um, making sure that there is enough housing, making sure that um, that uh, there are enough, uh, you know, schools and doctors' surgeries. I mean, you know, people will come. Part of this um, immigrant population will include teachers and doctors, of course, and other healthcare workers. But you need to invest in that and it will be well repaid, but also in social inclusion, also encountering that toxic anti-migrant narrative, which has, uh, you know, there's been an absolute dereliction of that among, among all sorts of leaders on the centre and left um, of parties in recent years. They've largely allowed that anti-migrant narrative to go unchallenged. And that's to the poverty of all societies. It leads to conflict. And as we've seen in Sweden, where it's it's led to these kind of silos, these very segregated societies that have not um, been socially included, um, the rise of uh, far right parties. It's um, this is absolute you know, fertilizer for, uh, for, for conflict and um, a misunderstanding between communities. You know, truly inclusive policies lead to, uh, lead to um, you know, much more productive, much more wealthy, rich societies. And I mean rich in, in all ways. Well, the, I mean, I, it's hard to argue with with the <laughs> with the case you make there, I mean, I I, I know personally, uh, and I think anybody who's studied this will know that uh, the world has benefited from migration overwhelmingly over the years, and there isn't a country that hasn't benefited from it. Um, you you one of the most striking passages I found in your book was your was the description you made of the world's largest refugee. Uh, camp that you visited, uh, I think, in preparation for your last book, um, with a lot of uh, 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 refugees, political, politically persecuted, um, Reninia from uh, um, Myanmar. Could you describe a little bit about that? Maybe talk about the distinction between refugees and, and migrants and, and, and what we might do to help refugees, particularly those who are escaping from, from the growing impacts of climate change. Yeah, so, so the, that is exactly a case in point. So the Rohingya live in this um, huge, there's more than a million people living in this caged camp um, where they're not allowed to work they're not allowed citizenship. So they're essentially in a kind of limbo. Um, you know, they're being supported in that they receive food aid, um, they receive, um, you know, UNHCR provides them with, um, you know, vaccinations for the kids and, and some sort of rudimentary healthcare. But their lives can't continue. And they're in a very, very, very like they're on a sort of denuded hillside, which is increasingly um, vulnerable to landslides and it floods constantly. It's a disease risk. It's quite gross there. You know, they, they're just it's it's not a permanent place. And yet they've been there for more than five years now. Um, and the, the government's actually trying to move them into a sort of reclaimed bit of land in a very, very vulnerable place in the middle of the um, Bay of Bengal, which is continually um inundated and, and vulnerable to storms i mean it's it's a crazy idea but this idea that these people who because of persecution in their homelands have have you know should, should spend their lives essentially unable to work and unable to carry on with their lives in a, in a kind of prison is i mean it's inhumane but it's also it's bad for everyone so so the Bangladesh government, you know, they're, they're incredibly poor people living all around this. So that's already a small bit of tension. And they, they did 
you know, they didn't, the, the local people, when these people, when these uh, refugees arrived, you know, they bent over backwards to support them in so many different ways. But then to leave them caged is not an answer because they cannot, they cannot move on with their lives. They can't integrate generally into the, the wider community or the wider world because they're stuck there. Um, they're a drain on and a political sort of sore point um, on the Bangladesh um, society, let alone um, the wider society. There, there is no benefit for anybody here. Um, they're increasingly prey to um, black markets, to traffickers of various types. You know, they're very vulnerable um, and they've got no hope. You know, they can't they can't move on. And as we see this situation increase you know there are already more than 100 million um migrants around the world a large number of refugees and the refugees are, are increasing you know if you compare the situation um of the rohingya to the situation um that happened um after ukraine was invaded by russia when the eu said from one day to the next okay people from ukraine can cross the border into the eu they can, um, they can live here for, I think it's about two years, maybe three, two, for two years, they, they will have access to healthcare, education, they can uh, work legally, they can travel across the different countries. You know, it's, it, that transformed the lives of the most desperate people. And the same could happen for refugees from wherever they are. Because people, they move along networks, they, they make use of the connections that they have, they support each other, we've seen that everywhere, communities come together to support, what they need is leadership um, to, um, to come up with policies that help this and support them doing what they do as humans anyway, which is support refugees. And, you know, the definition of a refugee or a political migrant or an economic migrant or whatever you call it, some people genuinely are fleeing for their lives. Others, you know, are, are trying to better their lives. Either way, they're not morally bad and they need support to, to, to be part of a society which they will then enrich. You know, all this investment is, is multiply repaid. All of our cities are built on migration. You know, whichever city it is, it is great because of the migrants that have moved there, either from other places within that nation or from um, other countries. Um, we, we rely entirely on that. And we, we particularly rely on it at the moment because, you know, across the global north and, and in many countries around the world, we're facing this demographic crisis where people are not having enough babies. Um, to support the elderly population in a few decades. And this is really going to hit um, productivity, hit growth, hit all sorts of, um, you know, it's going to become quite catastrophic. The only way through it is through immigration. And leaders, however cynically they, they uh, drive forward their anti-migration policy with one hand, secretly with the other hand, they're trying to get more migrants in because they know, you know, they know that we can't, we can't harvest our fruit and vegetable. We can't run our care system. We can't drive the lorries um, and trucks that actually, you know, transport the goods that we all rely on without migrants. We need these people. Labor is the, you know, the biggest resource that we have to trade. Well, uh, I, again, hard, hard to argue with the, the case you make for um, doing more to help uh, refugees from whatever, of course, but in, increasingly, of course, as we've seen, you know, in Florida in the past few days, fleeing from um, extreme weather events that are being made more frequent and intense from, from climate change. You, you mentioned earlier about the uh, key key issue of cities. Now, the majority of the world's population now live in urban areas. So can you just talk maybe briefly about how this particular issue and migration, what the implications might be for cities, say for a city like London, where we're both located? Yeah, so um, the population of cities that are viable will inevitably increase. Um, cities in the global north, 
um, and, and it will be the far north because what, what's happening during what will happen over the coming decades is that people will generally move to higher latitudes in the north because if you look at the map of the globe there isn't a lot of land in the south um, at higher lat latitudes so we're talking about um, we're talking about the north so they will either move to existing cities that will need to be expanded or they will um, be creating building their own new cities um, with a city like London, it will um, adapt. We've already had to adapt to um, uh, to to the situation of having a large population living on a tidal river with um, a Thames Barrier. Um, that may well need to be uh, to be increased. We're having all sorts of issues with um, aging sewers. This is these are the sorts of things that all. Um, all cities will need to adapt because we are expecting um, precipitation to change from that kind of constant drizzle um, of a temperate uh, country, a country in a temperate zone, to move much more into these um, sort of tropical extremes, which places like London didn't use to face. And that means things like droughts, followed by flash floods that um, come down very fast, washing off um, surface waters and cause all sorts of damage. So we'll need to move to things like storm drains, which are more common in um, countries that experience these already. Um, we'll, we'll need to um, change the materials that we build with. So moving away from carbon intensive materials like um, uh, concrete cement to uh, to more novel materials cross laminated timber is one but there are there are plenty of different um, options already um, the the um, the 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 way our cities are um, laid out so we, we're going to have to we're going to have to move to for example canopies over streets as um, hot countries already um, already have so that they provide a lot more shade we're going to have to have buildings that do more um, so they uh, create their own energy they recycle their air and water so that um, so they're not sort of a net emitters of heat and suckers of energy they do a lot more um, things all together um, we, we will have to look at um, other ways of conserving water so not just recycling but capturing rainwater um, through um, all sorts of, there's a big program at the moment in China for sponge cities, which it, it, what it means is around the city um, and, and in the city, they, they have uh, vegetation and um, reservoirs underground and capture for that rainwater. So it doesn't just course off causing um, damage and flooding cars and, and, and so on. Um, yeah, our cities will be different. Um, they will change, but I think they'll be a hell of a lot better. You know, we're looking at much cleaner. We won't believe in a few decades that we used to live in these um, in these cities where you'd walk along a row of cars just pumping out this toxic gas at, at you know <laughs> at, at, at a human mouth level. I mean, that that will be a thing of the past. Great, you know, that's great. Um, um, they, they will be denser, they will have higher populations, and some places will have to be um, abandoned, then they won't be viable, they will be flooded too often. Yeah, well, you've raised a very important point, and it's one that I, I mean, I personally have been doing a lot of work with uh, the London Climate Change Partnership to highlight to policymakers that if London wants to continue to be a globally competitive city, like any city, it needs to make sure that people feel safe here. And the uh, we've seen in the past couple of years, not you, know, you described the terrifying new feature of seeing wildfires around the outskirts of London, you know, encroaching on, on houses, causing houses to burn down on top of the you know the higher temperatures that cities have from uh, heat waves and, and of course it was only last summer we were seeing uh, flash flooding in London so cities do face all these and they'll have to become more resilient if, if they're going to be continue to be uh, centres that you know people want to live and work in so perhaps I could just come to one final point which is a more general theme I mean Given the theme of your book, I actually found it quite uplifting and hopeful. You you presented you present migration as a solution that will actually make the world a better place in spite of the uh, increasing harm and damage 
being experienced around, around the world from climate change. And it's quite unusual in that sense, because I think the environmental movement quite often comes across as kind of, you know, trying to scare the living daylights out of everybody and make you worry and feel guilty about everything. And I wonder if you had a view on that, you know, the, the relative roles of a kind of hopeful, optimistic one versus a kind of, uh, let's scare the living daylights out of everybody. You know, what do you think about the, the relative merits of those two approaches? Well, I mean, we are stuck in this um, this kind of extreme scenario, aren't we? Where on the one hand, we have people who either don't want to look or or deny what is going on and um, that this is a climate emergency. It really is a, a serious crisis um, and it won't affect them or if it does, it won't be very much. So we have that going on. And um, I would say that um, our current leaders um, in this country certainly are very much falling, you know, forming that, but it's not really that big a deal. So we don't really need to act particularly fast or make um, make any sort of big changes. I mean, this requires absolute systemic transformation it really does um to to uh, to get ready for the for the decades to come and then at the other end we have the kind of the sort of doomster this is all so terrible it's so awful we are completely um condemned to terrible to this terrible situation there's nothing we can do about it so let's do nothing about it really because like what can we do it's just awful um and that's also not helpful at all. Um, you know, the future is very much unwritten. We don't know what the temperature will be. We have many choices. And this is kind of born out of frustration, I guess, that, there, that neither of these positions is helpful at all. And what they both are is a sort of almost an abdication of the responsibility of now, of the present, where we do have these choices and we can make decisions which mean that this is this these scenarios won't happen if what we're doing at the moment is just like is allowing these catastrophic events to occur and then sort of dealing with them the best we can as they occur not very well generally um you know if <laughs> that that is not um that is not having any control or management of the situation it is not that is not making a choice. That choice is gone by then. So we now have to make a choice. And, and this book really, it's the, the idea is it's, it's pragmatic. I'm a pragmatist. I, I wanna look at what we face, which is very, very severe, but to say that we do have choices. Yes, it is radical. You know, these are radical, um, these are radical plans and radical solutions, but you know, the situation we face calls for radical solutions. These little incremental shifts are no way near enough to face what we have. You know, if you don't like the idea of, um, of managing um, migration, of managing this mass migration, then there are other options, one of which is like... Um, one of which is to turn the temperature down um, through uh, geoengineering, which may work. Uh, we don't know because we haven't tried it, but it probably would work to turn the temperature down. It would also have um, some uh, some side effects and require enormous amounts of negotiation. It's not an easy thing. None of these choices is easy. Moving enormous numbers of people is not easy. Um, so, so, you know, that's another option. But when I look at the decades to come, you know, I see not doing enough not doing anything, not taking decisions now, not having that vision, that idea of what we could achieve by the end of the century and then making a plan to reach that, to make it happen, because this is in our hands. I see that as leading to terrible conflict. And, you know, I don't want my kids facing, you know, the danger of being conscripted into armies to fight other people trying to escape their horrendous, um, you know, fire ravaged landscapes or inundated cities I don't want that I would much rather that they you know lived in larger busier more um, mixed integrated cities that's a much better option I think I mean I think we're going to have to use all of these tools and I don't expect everyone to agree with all of my solutions that I've laid out in this book at all I mean it's kind of my manifesto I don't I don't expect everyone to agree 
but it would be great if people actually started engaging and talking about these issues because at the moment we're completely ignoring them and that is much worse much more dangerous well Gaia um I think uh, we could talk for much longer about the book. I mean, it's an excellent book. I'm really big themes as you've just outlined here, but that's all we've got time for at the moment. Um, so um, thank you so much, Gaia, for, for making the time to speak to me today. And indeed to everybody who's tuned in to watch this uh, this conversation. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about everything we've discussed today guy's book is out now uh you can order it from foils and enjoy a special discount by using the code foils rsa20 or one word um uh, uh, uppercase so finally i'd just like to thank the rsa for hosting this event and to learn more about the work of the rsa and how to get involved in their global fellowship community, you can visit the rsa.org. Uh, once more, thank you again, Gaia, for, for both for making the time for the conversation today, but also for writing this book and uh, hopefully starting a very important conversation. And thank you all here for watching and see you next time. Goodbye. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Bye-bye.